first, before we kick off with the presentations, and I know we have PowerPoints as well from both our speakers, um, I'm just wondering uh, if I could ask each of you in turn for a quick sort of one minute on your background um, and, and why this, you know, why you're talking about this topic, really. Uh, so, Jen, would you like to give us a quick uh, overview of um, who you are and why you're here? Sure. Hi, I'm Jen. Um, so I work currently at Experimental Design as a, as a design lead, and we do world building uh, and sort of a future imagination, uh, ask a lot of what if questions and do a lot of visual storytelling uh, based in deep research uh, within different media platforms. Uh, I spent the most of my career in academia. I have a degree in media arts and practice where I focused on interactive architecture, um, which was a blend of storytelling and human computer interaction. Uh, I ran a research lab at the University of Southern California called Mobile and Environmental Media Lab, which is where a lot of this initial research in augmented reality began. And then I moved to Bristol um, in England uh, to, uh, uh, to become the watershed professor of design futures at UWE. And I was in the um, pervasive media studio at the watershed. Um, but I made my way back to Los Angeles and now I'm doing design work. But a lot of what I'll talk about today comes from my interest in architecture, interactive architecture and uh, sort of blending of physical and digital realities. Oh my goodness. As, as soon as you said world building, I had, I, and I apologize, you probably get this all the time, Slarty Bartfast from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> yes, I we talk really about liked, that. Yes, he really liked making Norway with all the crinkly edges. So. <laughs> <laughs> world building, good heavens, that's an amazing thing to say. And <laughs> Howard, could I throw the ball to you to, to give us something about yourself as well? Yes, sure. Um, so I'm Howard Griffin. I'm the Programme Director of the um, MA Architectural Visualisation Programme at the University of Kent. And primarily my, my work is involving, it involves getting students to, to learn um, how to do modeling, rendering, texturing, animation, film, uh, animation, uh, yeah, animation uh, virtual reality, um, augmented reality and so on. And one of the things that which I'll be talking about um, shortly is about uh, some of the work that we do with projection mapping and augmenting buildings through, through projection work. Fantastic. So we've got some um, very interesting topics coming up, which I'm thinking are going to be um, of direct relevance to, to us here in Medway. So as I say, any questions, please post them. Um, and um, uh, the other thing I should say is, uh, I know we've got one person who's, who's got the camera on that, which is fantastic. Um, I know our speakers are very happy for people to have their cameras on. Certainly when we get to the questions, if you've got a question to ask, we'll put cameras on, but otherwise feel free to leave it off. Um, sometimes that can help with, um, oh, excuse me, something's buzzing in the background. Um, that can help with, um, uh the bandwidth and things but we, we seem to be all right because we're a small number so i'm going to pass it back over to jen um who i believe will be talking about the brief history of augmenting towns and uh and where we're heading in the future with particular relevance to the artistic capabilities of it oh you need to unmute jen oh i can't share my screen yet oh you can't Perfect. Now I can share my screen. Okay. I guess the next question is, can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Right. Thank you. Um, okay. So as I mentioned, a lot of the work I had been doing was using emerging technologies for specifically for storytelling, um, but also thinking about the potential for art and play, especially when I was in uh, Bristol with the Playable Cities initiatives, um, thinking about specifically about how citizens can also start to augment their towns or cities and the kinds of tools that we have now that allow more participatory urbanism and uh, allowing people sort of a layer of a, a voice of what they might like to see in their cities or teaching them or towns teaching them through new te technologies. So to start off, I just wanted to talk about what when we say augment in the augmented reality, um, I think it can mean a number of things. And I've always thought about augmented augmented reality, not only through um, high tech technologies, but low tech uh, interventions as well. So I'm going to go a little bit through that as well. 
um, because I think when you think about making something greater by adding to it, um, it doesn't always have to be with technology when we're talking about augmented reality um, or to make greater, more numerous, larger, or more intense. Like our own reality hasn't been intense enough lately. Now we're trying to add more of that. Um, so hopefully we can do something meaningful with that. I still like to argue that citizens have always found creative ways to augment their, their towns or cities. Um, I think a lot about the act of walking and situations um, as augmentation. So the flaneur of the mid 1800s uh, up to the situationists and fluxus art groups uh, that would per create particular situations or happenings in their, in their areas um, just by the act of walking and seeing things differently or by these playful interventions that would ask people to see their cities differently. And I do think that when we talk about augmented reality specific to towns or cities or public spaces of any kind, we are really thinking about how we could see things differently and how we add an additional layer uh, to the spaces. So one second, I'm just going to move my little, there we go. I couldn't see my own slides. Um, so when thinking about emerging technologies right now, mobile phones um, come to mind when we think about augmented reality, but also sort of um, GPS, um, uh, Wi-Fi on, you know, sort of uh, local Wi-Fi or more Wi-Fi in our public spaces, uh, 5G, um, there's new opportunities to design platforms and fit and, and interfaces for creatively augmenting public space. So how do we use some of these new technologies to immerse people uh, within the spaces that they're in? So I like to think about how um, augmented, and I'm gonna use mixed reality as well, because I think that it's a really important distinction to think about the blending of the physical and the digital and not erasing what's before us. Um, I think, especially when we talk about equity and accessibility to experiences, um, we don't want to erase the world around us. That's what virtual reality is usually for. Um, but for augmented reality, especially when we're talking about our surroundings, I think it's really important to keep our real layer, our, our current layer of reality there. Um, but how do we add playful, meaningful, and uh, possibly enchanted layers to our everyday experiences of space? And what kinds of augmented interfaces, um, both high tech and low tech, can we design to encourage accessible and equitable participation and imagination? The image on, on the screen is actually a project that I really love. It's Candy Chang put these stickers around New Orleans after the hurricane many years ago, um, when the city was boarded up um, and there was very little electricity and uh, you know, people were displaced from their homes, but still sort of around New Orleans. Um, she put up these stickers to ask people what they'd like to see where things were no longer existed. And I think that this is a way of augmenting reality and also giving city planners or uh, you know, uh, developers an idea of what people really need in their areas rather than just putting up the things that we've always expected that we needed. Um, so I think that these kinds of low tech interventions can also be really a powerful way of thinking about how we augment our reality and get people to envision what else they might like to see um, where they live. So I wanted to um, go through a sort of a, a brief and rapid fire history. Um, it's meant to demonstrate some early projects that com combine smartphones and GPS um, with internet connectivity and cameras, not necessarily complete augmented reality as we understand it now, but the early predecessors to when these sort of personalized technologies that many of us started to carry around, um, how they kind of invited us to see our cities and towns differently, um, or how they would uh, try to subvert the ways that we might navigate. Um, and because I do a lot of world building and design fiction and think about speculative futures, um, I just want to talk about some of the cautionary tales as well. <laughs> um, I see, I just see a little number on the chat. I think we'll save questions, but since we're pretty informal, if anybody does want to jump in with a question, please feel free. Um, 
So this project, uh, Phantom City, um, in it was based in New York, and this was 2009. But this was considered a, a, a sort of augmented reality experience in which <clears throat> plan unbuilt plans of the city um, or speculative architecture uh, was placed around where it would have been if it did happen in New York. Um, I still have this app on my phone. I don't know if it still loads um, because it was also location specific um, to New York City. But I really liked the idea of the what ifs of what uh, space might look like if pl other plans had gone through or if these sort of wild ideas of architecture um, were possible uh, at a certain period of time. I've always been a really big fan of Archigram and Super Studio and some of the sort of architectural imaginings of walking cities or other sort of monolithic structures that might exist. Um, so this project, I think, was a, an early example of how we might augment our view of the a place we're standing and what could have also been there. This is another project that I really loved playing with. It was called Serendipiter. So it was sort of how can you make a serendipitous event out of of a sort of very basic application of uh, a mapping application. This is from Mark Shepard. Um, so you'd put in your location and you'd put in where you needed to get to and it would randomize a way of getting there to encourage people to see different parts of their town. Um, or it would ask you to stop and do something while you were walking in a certain direction. Um, I always loved the, just in this example, um, you know, to walk a certain way and then head toward the river. If there is no river nearby, make one. Like it's a prompt to imagine a different, a different way of being in a location that you are. And I think that these early examples that aren't specifically um, augmented reality are a really good way for us to think about what we might want to add as a different layer um, if we do start to think about everybody wearing augmented reality glasses or some kind of near future uh, technology like that. Then um, uh, the sort of when augmented reality started to become more about games, um, I'm, tr I'm just trying to leave the games out as, as much as possible, but it always comes back um, because playful experiences are often built on a platform where a number of people can participate. And Ingress, which was Niantic's first big project, um, was really about marking uh, uh, historical sites within Google Maps. So it, Niantic was part of Google, was part of Google at one part. Um, and the goal of Ingress, which was this sort of battle story of sorts, was a global story where people could participate together on their phones, but it really was about making landmarks visible in cities um, and asking people to submit what they thought important landmarks in their cities were. Um, so, you know, we generally can see certain things on maps that everybody knows is a landmark, but this also invited people to to sort of think about what they'd also like to submit and try to get into the system that then became part of a game world that was more of a shared experience. Of course, this led to Pokemon Go, which I think everybody now recognizes as augmented reality. Um, it did add a, a layer of characters of a known brand, Pokemon, uh, onto the world. Uh, but this was like the, the first real, uh, application that people said, oh, this is what augmented reality could be and is right now through mobile devices. Every, uh, when I say everyone, um, obviously there are people who do not have mobile phones and do not want to use augmented reality, but for the sake of what we're talking about now. Um, so when we start to look through our mobile phones at the world, there's obviously this concern of disconnecting and disconnecting from the people around us. Um, with Pokemon Go, you were still playing as a single player, um, but groups of people came together and started to share information and share their screens and talk with each other. And I had been in um, Washington State in this park, Bellevue Park, on the day that the game launched. And there were hundreds of people running around, sharing their experiences, looking at each other's screens, complete strangers. And this also seems strange now that we've all been in lockdown for a year and a half and haven't been running around with strangers. Um, but I think that there is a way to 
add these sort of participatory and shared experiences and augmented reality that I think will become a lot, uh, a lot more robust uh, in as the technologies get a little uh, faster. Um, so I like to think about how might we make our towns or cities more playful and playable in ways that will inspire people to take action or engage in more meaningful ways. It's fun to play together, um, but who's creating those experiences and how can we engage more as citizens as well to make these kinds of things and artists. So an example from um, one of the playable cities projects, um, I also spend a lot of time thinking about the internet of things and how objects could tell stories. That's a lot of what my research in my lab was doing. So this project was always a really good example of, of somebody else doing that. Uh, and not that we need to talk to the infrastructure in our towns or cities, but there is this way of thinking about how we embed local knowledge through prompts from the infrastructure um, as, in a playful way. Uh, it's a little anthropomorphic, but how can how can uh, we as town users or city users uh, leave bits of story behind through prompts from something like the lamp post or the post box or our favorite coffee shop nearby. Um, so this was just a platform to think about how you could use just text message to embed and leave a bit of a story that you might have a, a place in there. Um, this is on the low tech side of things, but I really also like this idea when we're thinking about augmenting a space. Um, this is no technology, in fact, other than the written word. Um, it's a braille handrail uh, at Castle San Elmo in Naples, and it describes in braille in both English and Italian this the view that you're seeing from there. And I thought that this was a really nice example of how we might think about augmenting not not just for people looking through phones or listening to the city or, or town around them, but how uh, the scene of that space could be described and through literature. Um, so it's also a sort of uh, a fictional description, but you can sort of then imagine what that might be through this. So again, not a lot of technology here, but still thinking about accessibility and who gets to experience augmentation in their towns or cities. Uh, there we go. Um, this is another project. Again, as I mentioned, it's not all about um, sort of the, the visible layer. But I, th I also like to think about the sonic layer. So this is a project by Duncan Speakman, who is also a colleague in Bristol, um, to use audio that he recorded in a number of um, environments that had been hit by severe weather uh, or natural disaster. So he came out here to California and recorded the sounds of a wildfire, um, <clears throat> the crumbling cliffs of England's east coast, uh, rising sea levels around Norway and uh, windy dunes of Northern Sahara. So he got to travel to a lot of nice places with his recording equipment. Um, well, nice in certain ways, some of them were burning. Um, but then he layered this on top of the, the place that you're walking around. So that's this idea of the sort of layering again um, and, and allowing these multiple realities to take place at the same time. Um, I'm going to speed it up because I know that we're I'm running out of time and my slides are also not advancing anymore. There we go. Um, so I just wanted to talk quickly about what we do expect, I think, as uh, augmented reality now. This is a project from 2018. Um, this used the HoloLens. Obviously, this is not a widely available technology right now, so I try to avoid things that aren't something that we can use and see this, but this was a project by Mel Chen that contemplated um, this, the possibility of sea level rising to 26 feet by 2100 in Times Square in New York. So this <clears throat> um, added a mixed, uh, mixed reality layer of uh, traffic jam of boats in Times Square and allows you to stand underwater and imagine what that might be like. Um, there were a, a number of other interventions as well but you could sort of check out uh, uh, HoloLens and sort of 
look at the city around you as if it were underwater. Oh, that's the video. I'm going to skip that. Um, there have been a couple projects in the past couple of years, and I think they become even more relevant um, as we're sort of not allowed to go to museums or other cultural institutions that we generally love to go to, um, to bring the art out into the city. Um, this was uh, in New York City. Um, I, I just like to show that people do often share their screens and try to participate. I've been to a number of experiences where even people who didn't have the technologies at hand um, were curious and others participating would stop and share and explain. And I think that there's a way of, um, of sort of talking about these kinds of things in public space that uh, it's sort of an interesting way to share uh, public space together. This was in London not too long ago, a number of projects. Um, and Olafur Eliasson had a project here. And he said, the current pandemic has caused immeasurable suffering and, dis and dis disrupted so much of our everyday existence together. This is especially true for those of us who value and take part in cultural life because many of the important cultural sites that we take for granted are all closed. Cinemas, theaters, concert halls, clubs, museums, and stadiums, the only public spaces where we could move about safely together are outdoors in the shared space. So thinking about how we can bring art into the into our sort of physical spaces um, safely, hopefully, um, and also start to have shared experiences outside and also allow people with their technologies to curate their own city or town in a way. Um, you sort of choose where you put these augmentations. So how do you curate your own experience in new ways? But I also think we need to think critically about a lot of this. Um, obviously, who does get to create these and who has access to these augmentations. So um, shortly after Snapchat released a uh, augmented reality layer to put a Jeff Koons sculpture in the middle of uh, Central Park, another graffiti artist came by and graffitied the augmented sculpture um, as a subversive act to show that not everybody wants these virtual or augmented layers built on top of their public spaces. Um, and of course, there's a short film by Kaichi Matsuda uh, called Hyper Reality. And he uh, presents a, a very provocative view of what if there are all of these layers? What is the advertising layer? What, how do our transactions change with our own selves? Um, this also pushes the sort of uh, intense gamification of the world around us. And I think it's a good critical lens on how we move forward designing who has access to the layers of reality and who puts things in front of our eyes. Um, so I'm going to stop there. Uh, but I, this was, I know there were a lot of questions uh, that I raised in here, but I do think that these are really important things to think about. Um, what do we want to see in our augmented or mixed realities? Do we want to see them at all? And how can we make these experiences participatory, equitable, and accessible to, to the most people um, to create sort of meaningful change or intervention into our towns and cities? Thank you. Thank you, Jen. That was fantastic. Um, I know there is there is that one question in the chat. Um, Jen, do feel free to, to answer it in the chat if you wish. Um, uh, in the meantime, we shall uh, take more questions at the end and, and live questions at the end. So now let's pass over to Howard. Um, and uh, yes, Howard, if you can um, talk to us about, uh, yes, projection mapping and how it augments uh, the buildings around us. Right, two seconds, let me just uh, share my screen. I've got sound on here as well, so I'm hoping that this um, this cuts through. So anyway, let's let's see how this goes. Okay, can you can you see that? Yeah, yeah, good. Okay, okay. So, as I was um, as I was saying earlier, I teach at the Kent School of Architecture at the University of Kent, and I run a master's program in architectural visualization. And most of our work in the course is is centered around creating images like this. So it's it's obviously heavily involved with architecture, but it's it's creating photorealistic images and animations of yet unbuilt architecture and in the, in the main it's, it's training students to 
to build to dis, uh, to visualize what the unbuilt architecture will be. And so they're already working in a in a layer of virtualism, if you like, um, imagining what the future will be like. Student, you can see <laughs> they even they've, they've sometimes they're a little bit hyper realistic as well when they're actually doing their own student accommodation as well, complete with bottles of Bacardi and and so on. But um, but anyway. Students on this course also study a mix of uh, a use of mixed reality in architecture. So we look at um, the use of VR and its application to heritage. So we often work with with um, organizations like English Heritage. Um, we've got an installation at the St. Augustine's Abbey, which you'll see um, shortly. And also the way that AR is used and can be used to help shape our urban environment. So it's this work that I want to talk to you about today. Um, we've already heard from Jen about the various forms of augmented reality that, uh, that we have. I like to talk about a different form, which is uh, which is projection mapping. So students on my course use projection mapping, um, use the term um, augmented reality through projection mapping, and they learn trying to understand how the medium can have an effect on building facades, um, shaping the way that we perceive architecture, um, buildings, and and our urban fabric. But firstly, we need to go back to um, the roots of projection mapping. So, and we go, but it starts here in Chambord in the Loire region in France. In 1952, Paul, uh, Paul Robert Houdin, the curator of the Chambord, um, Chambord Chateau, uh, devised a son a lumiere, or son, son, uh, sound and light show, to draw attention. His intention was to draw attention to the, the heritage that was there. So he had the audiences of the, of the 20th century, um, sitting there and he wanted to draw their attention to, to the 16th century architecture that was there. So he saw a way of doing this by using sound and light. And of course, in those days, it was just colored light and, uh, and, and the use of, uh, of live orchestras. So although today the technology has changed so that it allows us to project uh, imagery, film and animation, um, instead of just using light, the principles in many ways still the same. Of course, projected light, unlike screen-based AR technologies, is only effective at night. Some might see this as being a bit of a drawback. Um, however, I feel that as far from being a disadvantage, the nocturnal nature of this work, I think, encapsulates the, uh, the magical qualities it can have. So in daylight, a building is familiar, whilst at night, the building can be transformed or even augmented. So different projections interact with buildings in different ways. To make it easier to understand, I classify projection mapping installations into three categories, passive, physically active, and metaphysically active. Passive projections do not seek to harness a relationship between the animation and the building canvas. Uh, in many cases, the building serves purely as a screen or a backdrop to the animation to rest upon. A good example of this type of installation was seen at the Fête de Lumière in Lyon, in France. Um, it was called a Noah Fainson Cinema by a company called Pixel and Pepper. The piece uses the facade of both the Hotel de Ville and the Musée de Beaux-Arts as a canvas referencing the historic links that Lyon has with the birth and the development of cinema. This popular work predominantly used the two iconic buildings as large cinematic screens, only referencing the, the architecture fleetingly. And you can see just here, you can see there's some examples of where um, it does it in a compelling way, where it's um, this is um, obviously referencing different films and it alluded to Harry Potter and the twisting staircases, and it then incorporates into the facade. And you can see it working to, to good effect there. If the videos are not working properly, I've got the QR codes here as well, which you can just quickly scan it or take you to the to the YouTube links to go and have a look at that uh, in your own time. <clears throat> So despite this short interplay uh, between the projection and the architecture, Enoa face on cinema should, I think, be considered passive overall. Uh, a tribute to cinema, but probably not a tribute to, to architecture itself. A good test for this theory, I think, is to ask, would this piece have been significantly different if it was projected onto, say, Rochester Cathedral or, or Canterbury Cathedral or Rochester Castle? Would the, would the animation be significantly different? If the answer is no, then I think that that projection piece is, can be said to be passive. That said, what I consider passive projections can have a relationship with the built canvas. In 2014, Gilbert Coudin's Terre à Lumière um, was a work that extensively referenced the art contained within the Musée de Beaux-Arts. It's the same buildings we were just looking at 
a second ago, but it's just a, a different projection, different year. So the relationship fostered between the animation and the architecture in this instance is one which is based on a cultural reference, not on an architectural reference. So it's, it's obviously bringing the, um, the work that's inside the Musée de Beaux-Arts to the outside. Actually, there's an interesting point, which it goes a, bit, a little bit off script here, but it's uh, um, one of uh, the book um, uh, sort of author called Scott McGuire, who really talks a lot about new media and, and new media art. And one of his um, one of his statements is that he says the role of new media is to is to is to bring art to those who wouldn't ordinarily cross the threshold into a gallery. And it's a, this is a brilliant demonstration of that, because um, in 2014, 300,000 people went to visited the Musée de Beaux-Arts over that year. So they have, I think it's about 330,000 visited the, uh, went inside and had a look at the paintings and the, the sculptures and so on. Um, the weekends, so the, the Fête de Lumière is one weekend in December, around about the 8th of December. So for of those four days, 900,000 people stood outside and had, had a look at this um, projection piece. So three times the number of people saw the art on the outside of the building than saw the art on the inside of the building. And I think that shows the power of, of, of this type of work. <clears throat> uh, okay, so academic Dan Tor maintains that the specific nature of the site is a key ingredient in projection mapping projects, dis distinguishing it from the duplicative nature of the traditional cinema. He argues that a movie can play simultaneously on 3000 cinema screens anywhere in the world. And thanks to the generic nature of the screen, the movie will look more or less comparable regardless of where it is shown. Projection mapping, on the other hand, has an opportunity to harness a symbiotic relationship with the building and uh, between the image and the building. As an animator, Tor considers this process concretizing the animation. However, as an architect, I prefer to think of it as animating the concrete. And uh, this, I would argue, signifies the architecturally active nature of this type of work, where both the light and the architecture have an equal stake in this kind of work. In 2018, I'll just play this again. In 2018, renowned artists projection studio uh, displayed their installation line at the Cheriton Light Festival down near Folkestone. Um, the work involves projecting of light and dark shapes, which sought to create an architectural metamorphosis. The installation had been previously shown at other locations around the world, albeit mapped to different, different types of buildings. Here you can see an example from, from California, from Napa in, uh, in California. This luminous cloaking of the building aims to clothe the built form with a new skin. Another artist, Patrice Warriner, a veteran of light festivals, uses light in a similar way, creating polychromatic overlays that, that alter the way that we look at the building or a facade. Chromolith, as uh, Warriner calls his work, exemplifies this notion of reskinning a building. This is uh, an example. So uh, Patrice Warriner does this kind of work for, uh, across at lots of different light festivals around the world. In this particular example, this is from London Lumiere, this is Westminster Abbey's entrance. So this overlay of light and color demonstrates the inherent difference to other forms of augmented reality. Whereas AR, most AR applications need a device like a mobile phone or glasses such as HoloLens as we were just seeing to superimpose a virtual augmentation on an image, the projected augmentation of buildings far from being virtual fosters a physical connection. Um, this interrelationship between the photons of light and the surface of architecture creates a bond not experienced through other means of uh, augmented reality. Just to explain these two pictures, obviously we've, we've already talked about Pokemon Go and you can see that they, it, only, only, only the user can actually see the, the, the augmentation, it's not actually there. Whereas you can actually see the pixels. This is the same animation, this is the Anoa face on cinema, but me standing right next to the, to the uh, Musée de Beaux-Arts now, and you can see the pixels actually as they're touching the, touching the building. So this connectivity, between the light and structure is physical, the photons either being reflected off or absorbed into the material building surface. Uh, the micros this microscopic infusion represents an actuality of projection mapping, setting it aside from other forms of uh, augmented reality. 
Dan Tor argues that the, that the overlay of digital imagery through devices such as tablets or VR headsets uh, do not have the same relationship with architecture, where the image is the sole experience of the viewer. The building remains unaffected by this augmentation, whereas through projection mapping, the interplay is actual. Another distinguishing feature of projection mapping is the communal nature of that work, differing from the solitary use of a phone and a headset. Although people can come together with their handsets, everyone is standing there watching the same, the same projected um, installation. One of the early pioneers of projection mapping, Oliver Bamber, used the term spatially augmented reality. And although we now commonly use the term projection mapping, spatially augmented reality perhaps better describes this interplay between the buildings and the animation. So this leads me on to talk about the final category of projection, metaphysically active. I'll just let this play for a little bit. Sounds coming through. Does the sound is the sound coming through? play that but hopefully I can do the sound turn the sound off there we go so okay so this leads me to talk about the final category of projections metaphysically active projections which harness a synergy between the light and arc and the concrete so that the fusion is greater than the sum of its parts in 2016 Yanan Guema and Ezekiel uh, created evolution this piece is on the screen now an installation which was incorporated into the facade of the Cathedral de Saint-Jean in uh, at Lyon at the Fête de Lumière there. The, the cathedral is often used as a canvas for projected work during these festivals, but I would argue that Nguema's work really highlights the augmentation that can take place with these things. Evolutions was a po poetic interpretation of the history of the cathedral, alluding to a wider conflict between science and religion. The intricate Gothic architectural detail appears to warp and distort as if influenced by immense external forces, causing the facade to ripple and deform. This interaction creates a metamorphosis of the architecture, and I would argue this is the zenith of augmentation through projection mapping, where both the building and light combine, the result neither being solely architecture or being solely light. A few years ago, one of my students, Leanne Clark, produced a series of projections that sought to interact with a pretty unremarkable administrative building in Canterbury using, uh, using similar, similar techniques. Her series of animations interplayed with the geometry of the building, alluding to moving windows and bouncing facades and spinning floors, showing how the, this type of work can really affect even the most benign building types. I'll just leave this one playing a little bit just so you can see the, uh, the, the, the rotating windows, which I think is particularly effective. So to conclude, I believe that the augmentation of our built environment through projection mapping provides a magic irreality that differs from other forms of AR, allowing us to suspend our disbelief and become immersed in these changing landscapes. There are installations that fully embrace the magical sending dragons and fairies and other mythical creatures across facades and, and surfaces, of course. Um, but I believe that the truly magical occurs when the building itself is itself an actor within the performance. Um, sharing an equal stake with the animation. It's when this happens that the buildings come alive and the inanimate becomes animated and the immovable becomes movable. So I hope that wasn't too long. Fantastic. Well, we uh, we have eaten a bit into our, into our um, question time, but um, thank you. I think that was absolutely fantastic from both of you and, and so um well uh, 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 revelatory um I, i'm gonna i don't know if anybody's got any burning questions straight away um i have one put you do put your hand up or just wave at me for only a small group 
um, and uh, or, or if you put it in the chat, I can read it out. But um, I, I wondered if I could address probably to both of you, but I, I suppose it's m more um, in Jen's area. Um, when she was talking about um, uh, the business of there are particular apps that, you know, and things that you can uh, create and, and that participant visitors and, and ordinary people can take part in because obviously with projection mapping out it seems it's a very specialist um, skill to be able to, to work out how to do that but I'm just wondering if uh, you've got any examples Jen that you could give us of um, how ordinary people with their mobiles can take part beyond Pokemon Go um, um. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, uh, ordinary people do have to be able to sort of program some things, um, but there have been platforms designed that have allowed people to contribute, um, whether it be just sort of dropping an uh, object into space or uh, more of more of sort of the storytelling uh, platform. So a lot of the playable cities projects were designed so people could directly interact or comment through a mobile device. I think we need more people being able to do that. And that's uh, a matter of the right platform design for that. So when I say, how do we design that? I think that thinking about some sort of open platform for authoring on our cities where there is more sort of um, accessible ways of doing that is a challenge. Um, it's still a technically difficult thing to, to make augmented reality. You know. Um, you know, with lighting and with tracking and with placing an object in the physical world. So I, I like to think more about the sort of storytelling kinds of applications um, where people can contribute even, even sort of by sending a text message. There's often codes placed around cities where you could just text that and then other people can see. Um, there have been a number of projects over the past decade and a half um, that have allowed people to do something as as sort of s simple as that. But I think that the challenge and the opportunity is to create some new kinds of platforms for authoring your own towns or cities. Um, mm -hmm. And the I think I think now that people have become more uh, familiar with using their phones for like QR codes to scan menus at restaurants now or other ways of interacting with the world that hopefully we'll see those kinds of platforms being developed where we can also create these uh, augmented objects to drop in or to provoke yeah and then and then i i do have a question um for both of you that is to do with expense really a sort of larger question because um again jen when you were mentioning the uh, holoflex so i think you both mentioned it holoflex going screens or holo uh, yeah. equipment yes that, that that is required um those obviously are are considerable expenses for any organization or community or council or whatever to go to to go into what what are your opinions are the are the cost effective options or is there a an optimum spend you know that an a, a community has to look at if they're going to do this on any regular scale and large scale I mean, think so. At the moment, the technology is still very in its infancy, isn't it? So it's. Uh, I know Hololens has been around for a long time, and Google Glass is likewise. But, but, but they weren't on on general release, and um, and they're just in their first iterations, of course, second iterations now. And um, and so, I think as those as that technology develops, it becomes it's it's like double glazing, isn't it? Everyone suddenly gets double glazing. The cheaper it becomes, and the more it goes around, and I think it will it'll become like that. So. Um, I still can't get my head around the fact that the, the iPhone is still only you know, 16 years old and or, or, or so. And so that's it's quite astounding when you think about this, actually how much technology had. We all have an iPhone. We all have a, a, a smartphone now. And um, and so it's very quick for that technology to, to develop and, and become part of the, of, of the public sphere. Maybe it's not so very far away then. <laughs> well, I see Fiona's got her hand up. Fiona, would you care to uh, unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, yes, thank you both for such um, exciting and dynamic presentations. Um, my background is performance design and here in Medway, I'm, I'm chair of Creative Medway and I've seen, I think five cultural strategies come and go now. Um, and um, I think what fascinates me about what you have both been talking about is not just the sort of immediate relationship and some of those immediate questions that practical questions that Kate's been asking, 
but this relationship with time and visualizing time, particularly in terms of projecting forward and, and stakeholder engagement with the built environment, the prospect of the built environment rather than just the existing built environment. Um, and so I'm quite fascinated to hear what you think, what role you think um, the work might play in that regard. Um, I think in life, it, it feels very live. And I think it's about a live engagement of an audience. Um, and that live engagement is often between people, space and time. So I just uh, wondered if you could talk a little bit more about the time aspect, because this technology, it seems to me, has the capacity to envision time in a <laughs> in a truncated way in, um, in relation to the built environment where something might take 10, 15, 20 years to come into existence. Sorry, that was a bit of a ramble, but I'm just um, really interested to know what you where you would place it in that regard. Yeah, I think that that's a really interesting thing. That's why even Phantom City, which was very low tech, was something that I was particularly interested in taking plans, even proposals now that would take a longer development cycle to see how it would truly transform the world we're standing in. Um, you know, there's some more of the art, art based projects that are using things like climate change or other uh, ways of seeing what the future might look like that are a bit more speculative. But when it comes to something like, well, where, where might a community garden be? Or where might this new massive building be? Um, how can we just hold up a tablet or a phone and sort of scan the world around us to, to see and sort of click the options of, of augmented layers that we might want to engage with? Um, but I think it does invite the opportunity. And it's something like, like that where if we had a platform for people to to create and put their ideas up we could see what that would look like and have a more shared experience around some of those those visions or plans yeah i think if i can add to that as well so obviously architectural visualization this is what we this is what we do is, is create visions of of what um what, what what will be or what could be and uh, a lot of the student my work my students do is something called verified views where they create a static image to show and they and they can stand up in court and say this is exactly what the building will look like if you allow the planning permission for this to go ahead i think it, it's about stakeholders though and um and control as well directorial sort of control so of course a static image you can control that and you can you can make sure for sure that that's exactly as it uh, the, the image is going to appear or the building will appear as it is in the image um, but I think it's a little bit like 360 film as well, really, where, where I, I have absolutely no idea how these film directors manage 360 degree film and with, 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 the, with the crew and the lighting and, and, and so on, you know, so, and, but also so with, with architectural visualization, we do a lot of VR, not so much AR and, um, and VR is, is becoming, is becoming the, um, it's, it's becoming the, the expectancy really. So many, many people who are spending many millions of, of pounds, many millions of dollars on an apartment in New York or in Greenwich, they want to be in their apartment before their apartment's even been built. So they want to put the headset on, they want to think about what, what, is, what is it going to feel like, what's my view going to be like? And that's on a very personal level rather than on a community basis, I think, which, which AR would probably come in on that sort of level. But um, for there are these sort of level of expectancy. That comes with a caveat though, is that the more, often the more information you give a client, the more changes you have to make. So, uh, you know, clients would have buildings built on, a, on the basis of a perspective sketch of what that building will look like. And of course it doesn't look anything like it, it's a sketch. But, um, but now it has to actually look super real. It has to be so, so real and, and very realistic. And, um, and that's when the changes come in and the carpet changes or the sofa has to change or the windows change and, and that sort of thing. So it does, it does create problems as well. Yes, I'm interested on that. Um, sorry, I'm just interested on that macro level, um, and and I don't. I guess I'm not particularly concerned about an answer, but it's just kind of <coughs> interesting me that as a as a sort of stakeholder tool over time, to um, I mean, looking at Medway and thinking of what was envisaged for Rochester Riverside 16 years ago and what we now have uh, 
compared to the vision of what it could be, but who had access to that vision to then to at the time then go, no, we want this. Do you see do you see what I mean? Because the the vision was the vision for a wider population isn't sustained. It's kind of very limited access. So it well, kind so of I, unfolds I guess... in a way that in many ways, I mean, if, if we could introduce AR technology into planning planning system, then then it would democratize planning issues a, a, a great deal, as due, you know, purely down to what I was saying about that, that kind of directorial control is you can control, you can make the images look good and you can make the buildings look good um, in, in static images or in films and, and, and so on. But um, as soon as you lose that directorial control through, be it through VR or through AR, then, um, then yeah, it does the democratizes the, uh, the the issues of planning. That that leads nicely on actually, Howard, because I was going to ask each of you to um, wrap up with a quick key takeaways. What do you think are uh, the, the things that you would like us to, to take away as your key takeaways from from the conversation today? Um, that may be it. I don't know. <laughs> I'll, I'll let Jen go first on that while I think of something. <laughs> I would I would say that we're still in very early days of this, and I think that now's the opportunity to make good decisions about what we do want and have some sort of, of way of thinking about that uh, critically and creatively. The whole lens is still probably 10 years out for anybody to actually use. Uh, Apple says they're going to have a headset in 2023. I think they've pushed to now, but it'll probably be closer to Google Glass. Um, there's still a long way to go, but I think that there are creative things that we're starting to see. And I would personally like to see a platform where more people can participate in that. I think for me as well, I, I, I wouldn't underestimate the, um, the, the uh, the change in generations that, that are, are creeping up behind us as well. So, of course, one of my prerequisites for, for students coming onto my course is an ability to create 3D models and, and 3D modeling. But of course, all kids know how to use Minecraft and, and things like that now. So that, that that sense of knowing an X, Y and Z in terms of 3D 3D geometry is is, is second nature to so many, so many, so many kids these days. So it's yeah, I think I think um, Although we, we, we obviously need upskilling in terms of these technologies, we need technologies to develop with us. I think um, the, the, the generations will grow with, as the technology becomes more and more available for them. Fantastic. Well, thank you. And am I right in thinking um, that, um, Howard, you have some involvement in the light festival that's going to be coming up? Um, that's right. Yes. Yeah, so that. February next year um, is a, a, a light festival in Medway and my students will be projecting onto the part of the castle, um, castle, gr castle grounds to, um, to, to help celebrate the bid for the uh, city of culture. Fantastic, a lovely combination of the new and the old there. Um, well, if I may, on behalf of everybody, unless there are any other questions, <coughs> um, I don't think so. So I would like to say thank you very much once again to um, Jen Stein and Howard Griffin. That's been as I say, completely revelatory and uh, fascinating and given, I think, all of us some food for thought. Um, I'm just going to wrap up and say there is a snap poll that I've posted in the chat. If um, anyone who's on the call is able to quickly fill that in, um, it's useful feedback for uh, Electric Medway. Um, and one final thing, tomorrow uh, I'll be here again at 10 a.m. for the next talk, which is Spaces for Tech Artists. So I see how that moves on. That links quite nicely. Um, so uh, do feel free to join us at 10 a.m. again tomorrow if you've pre-registered. But in the meantime, um, Jen Stein, Howard Griffin, Augmented Towns, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.